Hi everyone, welcome to our event. This event is brought to you by Data Docs Club, which is a community of people who love data. We have weekly events. Today is one of such events. If you want to find out more about the events we have, there is a link in the description. Go there, check it out. I think right now we need to take care of putting more content there. We have more events in our pipeline, but for some reasons we still did not announce them there yet. So check this link from time to time, but for now, do not forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. This way you will get notified about all the future streams like the one we have today. And also there is another thing that you will see in the description. There are actually two things. So one is this one, our amazing Slack community where you can hang out with other data enthusiasts. But there is another thing, which is our MLOps course that starts next week on Monday. So I think today's topic is somewhat related. You will see so, but in the meantime, or after the talk, whenever it's convenient for you, go check it out. There is a link to our MLOps Zoom camp, which is a free course about MLOps. During today's presentation, you can ask any question you want. There is a link in the, in the live chat. Click on that link, ask your question. And I think we will cover these questions at the end, right? Or is it okay if I interrupt you? What do you prefer? Um, I don't mind. You can also interrupt me. Um, okay, if it's on topic, if you if something on your slide that is relevant to the question, or the question is relevant, then I'll just interrupt you. Sounds okay, perfect. Tino, the floor is yours. Please start. Thanks very much. I'll quickly share my screen. Um, thanks for having me. Um, I'm super happy to to be part of this to talk about. Um, what I talk about a lot on LinkedIn, which is standardizing machine learning and life cycles. And obviously I love to do it in one of my favorite communities here. So I'm really happy to, uh, to have that opportunity. Oh, thank you. Yeah, definitely. Um, today's topic is from data to deployment. And um, I'll talk about how to build standardized ML life cycles fast. That might sound a bit cryptic in the beginning, but we'll go through it one by one so that you understand what I mean by all these components. What I'll talk about is first I'll do a quick introduction to explain you why I think this topic is so important, why I'm so passionate about it and what it actually is. Then we'll go into three areas which I think are the most relevant ones, which is the design phase of a project, the build phase and the monitoring phase. And yeah, once you have questions, just drop them in the um, dedicated place and we can either discuss them right away or at the very end. Okay, first one, introduction. Let's quickly clarify some things. When I talk about standardization, this doesn't mean that we all have to do all the same work, right? So I know companies are very different from each other. I know that people like bring in their thoughts, their creativity, and their work. But I still think that some kind of standardization, however it will look like, and we'll talk about it in a bit, is always really helpful within one organization or within one project to have more reliable results, to ship faster, and to ensure that the output quality is what you expect it to be. One example is that we at Shopify, where I currently work, um, had a model shipped in three days just because we had a great fr framework in place for it. And we were just hats down for three days and had great results with a similar framework. As I already mentioned, I'll, I currently work at Shopify. I'll skip a deeper introduction because I think that's the boring part of that um, conversation. Nevertheless, I'm currently senior data scientist at Shopify. And I work there mainly on revenue and sales related topics. And from there, I'll pick a few few examples today to show you what I mean when I talk about this topic. And as I said already, every company needs its own playbook. So what I'll tell you today is an idea, a framework, some, maybe you get creative based on this, but what works at Shopify, for example, will not work in other companies one-to-one, -one. maybe in some, but definitely not in all. So keep in mind that when we talk about standardization, about all the things you can do, keep in mind that you have to really check if this also works for your use case. Interestingly, and I think that's something I learned over my over the few years of my career so far, is that standardizing like frameworks like this can help enterprises, 
about as well fast growing companies because surprisingly, even though they are in different stages of their company life, they face similar challenges. And that's why I think this is very interesting for many data scientists, data engineers, um, data analysts, or so whoever works in that field. To quickly clarify two terms, because I think they can be interpreted very differently. So starting with ML ops, how I understand it, how many other people understand it, is that it is a set of practices and methods for developing, deploying, and maintaining machine learning models. And the interesting part here is that we talk about developing, deploying, and maintaining. So we have the full package, the full life cycle, how I call it, because you start from the very beginning, you think about how do I want to develop it? You develop it, you put it into production, and then after that, you also have to take care of it. The second part is ML life cycles, and that's probably a word I'll use a lot because um, I'm just used to, to it. And here, the important part is that it's systematic and iterative. It's this process that basically covers all these phases. And iterating over your model and over whatever application you build is just very important and the systematic aspect of it that you know in what stage am I, what I have to do in that stage and what are the requirements. I think once you understood this concept, it's really easy to develop data applications a little bit faster. Let's dive into it. So as I said earlier, the first stage is the design stage. So you start planning your ML project accordingly. I call it now ML project because that's the majority of my work. If you work on a non ML related, but still tech or data related project, I think these tips and tricks can still help you a lot. At the very beginning, we figured out that having the right team from the very beginning, from day one is crucial. So what we do is we start by going through all the stakeholders we need, all the key stakeholders. Let's say we build an application for our key account team. We might need someone of their team. We might need someone from the legal team, from the obviously data team um, and so on, so that we have a really, really long list. From that list, we look at who exactly we want to take from that individual department. The reason for that is you always want to have a decision maker in your group. Just imagine you have to make a difficult decision. You discuss it in your project team. And from there, you have to go to ask for permissions or contact some decision makers, usually people that are really, really busy. And this just slows you down. If you set up your team from the very beginning really well, you can make these decisions within minutes. You have someone on the table, you can tell you, okay, here are the resources, yes, you can do it. And the fundament for that are communication channels. So how we do it is similar like the team. In the very beginning, we set up communication channels. We have a working group in place. We use Slack a lot. So we have a small working group. It's just fast communication, et cetera, et cetera. But then at the same time, we have something like an announcement channels where we post weekly updates so that other teams who are not directly involved but still interested do not have to ping us all the time, but they can go to that channel and look at it, um, understand where we at, if there is a delay or if we are um, shipping in time. Because again, these side conversations are just draining. They consume energy, they consume time, and you want to avoid that if you want to focus on building applications faster. After building the team, you have to collect requirements. And this is, for me personally, one of the most important parts. And from a technical perspective, I know fairly straightforward what requirements we need. How often does, in that case, for example, our model need to be trained? How often does it have to predict output? Um, how available has the data to be in what format, et cetera, et cetera. So I, from a technical perspective, have a good idea of how that could look like. But then on the other side, we have the business requirements that have to be fulfilled. Let's assume we build a churn model and we surface a churn score between 0% and 100% representing the likelihood of churn. We, for example, know that our business stakeholders, they want more information. They just don't want one number. They want to know 
how this numbers put together, what are factors that influence it? How do we present the numbers to them and the information to them? So we had many, many cases where we didn't specify the business requirements. And then once we were done, had to go back to the beginning and do a few changes on the technical side because we didn't enable the business to really use our output. And that, again, saves you so much time if you specify this from the very beginning. As a result, you have your ML design. Again, in that case, the ML model or the ML application. However, that can vary from team to team. And all the three steps sound really trivial and really straightforward, but I can promise you so many teams do not take the time to do it. They build a small core team, add people from now and then, but not from the very beginning. You have to catch up with them. You have to bring them up to speed. That all costs time and um, is slowing you down. Same with the requirements. If you have all of that, you can build the design and from the design, your project proposal. And that's something I can recommend every team to do. The project proposal can look like this. As you see, I try to avoid a lot of text. I try to um, focus on a visual aspect, but a project proposal in the end is a summary of all the steps we just talked about. So you wanna describe the problem. You wanna understand what are we trying to solve? Why is it important? What opportunity do we see here? So. Can we increase revenue? Can we reduce costs? Can we increase the efficiency? What is our proposed solution? How does it look like? How is it designed? Why is it the right solution for this problem? What risks are we facing? Maybe we could fail. Maybe we could face some limitations because we don't have the data or whatever it is. And a timeline. This is the bare minimum you should put in your project proposal. Because again, if you write it down, all of these steps, you know, okay, this is what we're going to build. This is where we want to end up. And these are the people involved. That's the timeline. And again, this is something you can use as communication tool to other, um, to other stakeholders to ensure that they are up to speed. I know this part was not really technical, but I noticed that the design and the communication always takes so much of my time, which then leads to the fact that I can focus less on really building something, which is actually the next step. So in my last project, I took care of that. I took a step back, designed it properly, prepared resources to be able to communicate all of that. Now let's assume we've done that, we did it, it's great. and people leave me alone and let me build my application. Come yeah, people don't leave, leave you alone yet, just yet, because there's a question. Okay, uh, yeah, While sure. we're still on the design phase. So the question from Nick is, do you have a standard for the weekly status documentation? And how does it vary with projects? Um, so do I have a standard and? For the weekly status documentation, like for you, I, I think at the beginning when like building yeah. the theme. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have, um, yeah. yeah, exactly. We have a, we have a, um, we, we do it weekly. Um, I think that makes sense. It depends a little bit on in what frequency you want to update people. Sometimes weekly is um, too frequent for us. It works really well. I think weekly um, can make sense. And then we have a template. We say what we did, what is at risk, um, eventually how we want to solve it and what blocks us. So these three are definitely in every single update we do because then people know, okay, this week we did this and that. We might miss a deadline or two or, or not, that even better. And also what is currently blocking us because sometimes read the blocker, someone reads the blocker and it's like, hey, I might be able to help here. I can unblock you. And that um, like these three aspects were really helpful, but again, can be extended to whatever you need or be removed if you think one of the three doesn't make sense. There's more. So uh, is the timeline realistic at all at this stage when we don't even have the data? Exactly. That's, um, that's a very good point. I personally am really bad with setting timelines. That's just something I under or overestimate really often. So I think to really set a good timeline, you should know what, what data you have, right? So I, if you've been with the company for three, four years, you usually know what data exists. 
and in what state it is. And then it's easier for you to estimate the time. If you're new to a company and you don't know it, then it's really hard to estimate um, a timeline. I would say I've been with Shopify for more than a year now. I have a good understanding of what data we have and in what state it is. So I feel confident estimating a timeline more or less. And in case of doubt, I always add a week or two to give me some some time to breathe. Mm. Or perhaps you can add some buffer buffer in the in the timeline. Okay, now we need to investigate uh, whether whether we have data, what kind of data, what kind of state is it in, and then after that you come up with like a final timeline. So you do this in the build phase, I guess, or in the design phase. Is exactly, that exactly. That could also be, um, as I said earlier, part of the technical requirements. Um, if you want to to understand all the requirements you need for your um, project, you can say, okay, we need these, these, and these data points. And maybe you have an idea if they exist and in what state they are, or you don't. And then you can, in the build phase, add a phase where, um, or like add some, some days or weeks to investigate this. So this could be part of the requirements. And another question. Uh, is also for me. Thanks for asking questions. How much time would you say is usually spent with this iteration, like from the team selection to the proposal? Ideally, um, so how, how it works, like I, I personally think there are two ways of, of launching a project, right? So on the one hand, you have business stakeholders coming to you and ask you, hey, we need something churn related. So they have a broad idea of what they want, what they need. And then you just have to phrase it and phrase the problem and um, put it into a context. For me, in my experience, that is the faster way of doing it. However, you also have a, um, the option to propose projects yourself. And in my experience, that takes a bit longer because you have to convince more people to free up resources for the ideas you have that might not be 100% the focus of the company yet. So ideally, in the first case, when business stakeholders come to you, I would try to spend a week on building this project proposal, gather as much context as possible. Generally, a work week has 40 hours, that should be sufficient. In the other case, it takes longer, it can take two weeks, it can take three weeks, depending on the scope and the impact. But yeah, in case one, I'd say a week. Okay. Yeah, thank you. No more questions cool. for now. Great. Thanks for asking the questions. Those were great questions. Let's go into the build phase. Um, I think the build phase could be a series of workshops itself. There's so much stuff you can automate, you can standardize, you can speed up. But I chose, again, four major topics that I think were crucial to, to our success so far. The first one is a feature store. The feature store, in my view, became a bit hyped over the last years, very popular because you have ac access to features right away. However, I wanna take a step back and break it down a little further. So not every company needs a feature, feature store. I think they help every company, not gonna lie. But I also think if you have standardized metrics that could be great already. So what do I mean by standardized metrics? Let's assume a company wants to build a churn model. Let's stick with the churn model. I think that's a great idea. A company like Shopify. So a Shopify, it's important how many orders a merchant does, right? So you can imagine a merchant that has hundreds of thousand orders per year is more likely to stay than someone who has one or two orders per year. So what we want to know is what are the number or the count of orders per shop, per merchant, whatever. And ideally you wanna have one source of truth. So we could go and say, okay, let's sit down and build one data model that gives us this transactional behavior or this order behavior that the entire company can look, like, uh, can look at. So we have this one data table that is definitely the source of truth and every ML model can go there retrieve the data and, um, and use it for predictions or analysis. So what I wanna say with that is that you can use a feature store, that's great. But if you don't have the capacities, maybe it's not, not a priority at the moment, I would recommend to have sources of truth. So if you have, yes, 
good metrics that you know multiple multiple departments can use, build data models that are really, really reliable. And from there, many models can easily retrieve the data. So that's the case for us. That's how we build models fast because we have basically a repository that has these standardized metrics. And within Shopify, everyone knows if I need data points, I can go there, I can retrieve them. And I rarely have to double check them for data quality or if they're calculated correctly because we all know this is the baseline for many things we do. And this feature store, or what I just described, is also a mix of business knowledge and um, feature generation because someone else has done the work before and that speeds me up in the long run because I don't have to build the features anymore because I know my colleagues already engineered a few features. They already calculated a few metrics and I can just go there, retrieve them and build my training data set really, really fast. And I think that's where many people struggle or many um, data practitioners struggle to get their training data right because that takes a lot of time. It's a really messy process. And if you get that process right, I think you will succeed in shipping fast and also um, perform better than other companies. I think that's, that's where it all begins. After the feature store, we still do the quality checks. We obviously trust our colleagues. We know they did a great job, but sometimes something in the background fails and maybe we have missing data. Maybe we have, I don't know, too many null values, duplication, whatever. And that's no one's fault. Sometimes systems just break. It is what it is. And that's why we automate our quality checks. Again, we have a certain pattern that we follow. We check for duplication. We check for uh, missing values. We check for values in a certain range, right? Um, and these checks can be automated. If you use tools like dbt, for example, easy. You can just add a flag. If you don't, you can write a simple Python script that takes your training data and checks for null values or checks for duplication and flags any issues with your data. And that should be systemized. So across the company, you should have a certain set of data quality checks that everyone can access. Ideally, a central repository, again, because I don't want to write the code myself. I have a central repository and I just um, get the code from there or I import some library and can perform the quality checks. Always automated, always before I retrain, always before I perform predictions because I never want anything failing. And with a pre-existing feature store and the data quality checks, within a few clicks, ideally, you have your clean and reliable training data ready. Now you could think, okay, what if one of the data quality checks fails? Um, and there's a great quantitative approach to do that, which looks something like that. So that's um, a chart I did myself, just as example, where on the left side, you see all the checks I would for example, perform, it's a duplication check, data freshness so that the data is not outdated, um, the right amount of missing values, um, if there's data drift or not. So I use the PSI, Population Stability Index, to check that. Uh, if there are too many outliers, yes, no. Then on the right side, you can see that one means, okay, test passed, all good. Zero means not passed. And in that case, 80% of the tests passed. So I could now sit down and that again, depends from company to company. But I, for example, would not proceed with the data here because if I perform five checks and especially data freshness, um, you could give it a weight or not, uh, does not pass. I don't want to use that data because it's likely to be outdated. So that means that my data quality is at 80%. I'm not satisfied and I can ping someone who takes care of the data freshness. And at that point I, I didn't do much. I just retrieved pre-existing features, I used pre-existing data quality checks and have a measure of how good my data quality is. Okay, so I would not proceed with that one. Let's still continue with the, the presentation. After that, model evaluation is a big topic. Mm -hmm. There are a few I... questions about feature store. I'm just wondering sure. uh, like if it's okay if we cover them now, because like uh, how, many, how many other slides you have? Um, yeah, still a few. Want to be um, mindful of no, no, okay. Let's, okay. let's, 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 um, let's, yeah. So how to decide if this organization needs a feature store or not, or when do you realize that they need like, or because from what I understood, it kind of seems like you always need it. Uh, but is yeah. it actually the case? 
Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I think there's no there's no yes or no, right? So I personally would rather, I would try if I'm really heavy ML company, I would try to implement a feature store really, really early. The reason I say ML focused company is because many companies are not there yet, right? So company, many companies I know I talked to are still in the reporting phase or like getting the data right, more in the analytics engineering space still, which is great. And I think for those companies, as long as they don't as they do not start to ship models frequently, I would say you don't really need the feature store yet. It would be great if you have one, but you really don't need it. But if you start focusing more on predictive modeling or on um, things around that, if you see, okay, we shipped a model now, the next project, again, it's, an, it's another predictive model or something like that, then I would start considering a feature store Obviously, there's no there's no time. I can tell you, I cannot say after twelve months, after two years, you should consider a feature store. I think it rather depends on the frequency in which you build models. And if you get the feeling, okay, suddenly feature engineering is a thing we do often, and it takes a lot of our time, then this should be a signal to consider a feature store. Okay, thank you. And. Um... Another question from Erjon or Erjon. Sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your name. Can you give a real example of this feature store? And I, I'm not sure if this question means like a specific piece of technology or uh, I don't know, a specific use case for this technology. Maybe what? Yeah. Um, I can later on share a list of, um, of technologies we use and a list of technologies I um, sure reckon useful. are uh, super helpful, but basically, Every every big um, every big data platform has a feature store. So if you go to Google, Amazon, um, I don't know, Feature ML, like there are many many out there. We at Shopify use a um, one we built our own. So because Shopify, obviously big company, a lot of resources, very specific resources, we use our own feature stores. But uh, there's a bunch, and I'm happy to share a list later so you can take a look um, with a bit more time. Yeah, thank you. Cool. Um, I'll continue. Is that okay? Perfect. You, you don't see me, right? Because I was so. No, no, no. This no. Thumbs up. Yeah. <laughs> no so, sorry, I don't see you. I, I just see my screen. <laughs> um, uh, great. So now we did um, our training data, we did our quality checks, and are now evaluating the model. I'm pretty sure everyone listening to this has at some point evaluated the model knows what to do so um and i also personally that's a maybe a controversial um, opinion but i think building ML, ml models is a solved problem we take our data we fit the model and we then just analyze the results so i think the challenging part for us now becomes less getting a model but more understanding if that model has a benefit to it and also here, so let's say we have our training data, we model our training data, um, we model our uh, model, and then uh, want to evaluate it now. Here again, you should know before you even build the model, before you start writing the first line of code, you have to understand what business metric is the important one and what statistical metric is the important one. Because we as data scientists, data analysts, data engineers often focus on accuracy, um, area under the curve, precision, recall. That's all great. But in the end, most businesses want to make money or want to acquire customers. And that is also an important part. You have to know which metric is the primary metric and which is the secondary metric. And for us, for example, we know that in our department, we know, okay, we want to reduce costs. So this is always the primary metric. Even if the accuracy of the new model is down and the costs are reduced even more, we would go with that because in the end, that's what we care about. We don't care about the statistical performance alone. And that might sound a bit weird, but I'll show you an example. So what we have here is on the left side, a cost matrix. So you can read it like that. If we predict um, that someone churns, for example, and it's true, then um, we lose five euros. If we, if someone churns and, um, or churn is now maybe uh, a bad example, 
uh, should have thought about that before. But if we basically predict negative, so false, and the actual outcome is positive, we make money. And from looking at the cost matrix, you can just see that there are different values depending on what the outcome is and what we predicted. And if you go one column to the right, you have model one. And if you go one column to uh, the right again, you have challenger model two. The numbers you see in there is the count of instances. So you see they are slightly different with challenger model one. We have a big, big focus on um, actual negative prediction and um, predicted also a negative prediction. And challenger model two uh, is a bit more distributed. And the I'll share the slides obviously later so you can take a closer look and we, have, we don't have to go through it all the time. But I calculated the accuracy and the costs below. And what you can see is that the Challenger Model 1 has lower accuracy than the Challenger Model 2. So from a purely statistical perspective, we would say hmm, it's not that good. But if we look at the costs, we see that Challenger Model 1 also uh, has low costs. So we might think, OK, the statistical performance is not that good, but the costs are lower. So we would reduce our costs by a bit and therefore only looking at one statistical metric can be misleading. And you need to have this framework in place to evaluate your model based on your business value and on your uh, statistical value. And that sounds, again, really trivial, but I know many companies that do not know their order of priority. So keep that in mind. Another thing that we then start doing when doing our um, evaluation is model cards. So you can use TensorFlow for this. Um, TensorFlow has some functionality to create these cards. It's really helpful. It's super easy. And what it does, it's just an overview of your model. So on the top left, you see the model details. On the top right, you can manually add um, considerations. On the bottom, you see some information about the training set. And it can be extended. Like It can be huge, huge, huge. And that's great because with this, you can, with using TensorFlow, you pass your model some information and you cre can create a great overview that you can attach to your repository, to your documentation. So whenever someone new comes to the project and wants to look at what does the model actually do, you have an overview um, like this, which is super helpful. So we can definitely recommend using it. And then in the end, the last step is after you have your training data, your quality checks, your evaluated model, you want to save and versioning it because you a model store is the place to do that first of all a model store could be anything it could just be a folder in your google drive it could be something more professional but feel free to start with just a folder in your google drive name it model v1 and put in all the documentation the trained model the docker file for recreating the environment you want to put everything in there to reproduce results because it might be that a version two will come, a version three will come, and you want to know what did we test in the past, what worked, what did not. Can we reproduce the results from the past because we have to compare them to today's result, et cetera, et cetera. So I cannot stress how important the model, you know, stress enough, um, how important the model store is because you just know what happened in the past, how did we get there, and can we reproduce it? So it could be in your GitHub repository, it could be in your Google Drive, but if you don't have it yet, feel free to start. Any questions to the build phase? Yeah. So I'm just trying to parse this question. Um, yeah, so uh, I'll start with this one. What if you have the same model, but you update the data set with the few data set with the same features frequently? Um, and you monitor so, changes, small or big ones. So, so, so I, start... I keep it. Mm -hmm, sorry. Should they start again? So long yeah, it, yeah. That'd be so great. just the idea there is that you have the same model, but you retain it, right? Because you have the okay, same yeah. features, but you retain it on different uh, parts of the data, like you retain it the newer data. Yeah. And if you want to monitor think, changes, would you recommend to use a feature store for this case? I mean, any anything that helps you um, versioning will will help you there, right? So. It could be it could be um, versioning in a feature store, but it could also be just saving the training data, right? So I think 
or at least from my experience, changing the model like from I don't know XGBoost to a random forest or so, that's not where the big improvements come from. The big improvements come from adding features, adding meaningful features, engineering features. And either you do that, you, you just need some kind of versioning. It could be in a feature store, it could be also you just save the um, training data as CSV and store it somewhere. Or if you use um, SQL queries, you're versioning the queries and store them somewhere. So overall- and hope that um, data doesn't change in the database. That, that is that is a different uh, thing. Obviously, if the definition of a metric suddenly changes um, and yeah, causes trouble, that could be that could be problematic. Okay. Yeah, so I guess we can go to next phase. Perfect, perfect, great. So from my experience, that's the phase no one really loves. And I think that's, um, that's still an important phase. So I know everyone's really excited about conceptualizing something, building something, but most likely you're already a few weeks in, maybe you're, you're a bit bored by the project or you want to do something new and um, you have had the big impact and the exciting tasks already. Nevertheless, you have to take care of your model after deployment, right? And I think once I learned this, I had way less stress at work because starting my journey, I had not put too much focus on monitoring. I thought, okay, yeah, I just set up some alert, we'll be fine. But then something fails, you don't have good debugging technique and logging, and it slows you down again, right? So we're back to the topic to be standardized across the entire company. So even if my model fails, someone else should be able to understand what's happening because that speeds up the entire company and it's just a really good standard for us. So that's why I came up with this decision tree of what type of alerting do I need? And do I need an alert or do I need a warning? Because a warning sends me a message, maybe to my Slack and says, hey, keep an eye on this. An alert though should make you stop working on whatever you do and let's let you start debugging it right so again i um i share the slides you can you or take pictures but first of all we decide what we want to monitor right an example could be data quality so if we make predictions on a daily basis we want to make sure that these predictions get really high quality data because otherwise other business stakeholders might act up on it and if they act on wrong predictions, that can be harmful, right? So we set up a monitoring. I use Datadog here as an example because in both companies I work so far for, we use Datadog. Um, so we're great with Datadog, but you can use really any tool. Um, if anything happens and it was normal, just create automated reports. Like you still, even if things go well, you want to see it. You want to be able to look at it. You want to be sure that the things running are running smoothly are running as fast as you expected etc if something unusual happens you have to figure out mm, is it really important or is it not that important let's say we have a model that um, runs every day but the results are only used end of the month it could be forecasting is always a, finance forecasting is a good example for that often a model is set up to run every day. It's not best practices, but you only need the results at the end of the month. So you might have a few days to fix it. Nevertheless, you need to fix it. But if you, for example, have a chatbot live that your customers depend on, you want to fix this right away, right? So yeah, again, if it can wait until tomorrow, you can create a ticket and the owner can use it. Ideally, this ticket either is created automatically or someone gets a message to create a ticket. If it's really important, you wanna set up an automated alert that is on multiple channels. So if it's really urgent, set up an email and maybe uh, a message on your phone um, or an automated call, whatever is possible, whatever you wanna hire. Um, other, otherwise, if it's not a significant deviation from the normal status, you wanna just send it to Slack, for example, with an ad. So you are aware right away, but you don't wake up in the middle of the night. So again, this is one example I chose now. This might be more complex for your organization. This might depend on the department you look at, but what helped me is just visualize the process. Because if I, for example, built a new model 
and I wanna set up an alerting for the data quality checks, I can go down this tree and in the end know, okay, this is medium high priority if it fails. So I just send warnings to my Slack because I know that's fine. And then I set up these warnings to make sure I get Slack notifications if there's something wrong. If I though work on our chatbot, I know I wanna be informed right away um, on my phone. So I choose chose a different path of this tree and I get a different type of alert. And just knowing when to alert, when to warn and how um, is very important because you know right away what to do. You don't waste time, you don't waste money. And then the last thing about monitoring is you could have changed these two topics, but I like them more in that order. So I'm talking here about deployment. I would first set up monitoring and then deploy my model just for the reason from second one, I wanna monitor my deployed model. That's why I set up the monitoring first, if possible, sometimes it has to happen parallel. Um, but then I wanna roll it out, right? There are three different ways of doing so. The first one is canary rollout. I think that might be quite uh, popular. I know, for example, the Google Cloud Platform allows you to do this really easily with a few clicks. What that model does is 90% of your traffic goes to your current model, to your actual model that's live anyways, and 10% goes to the new model. Why is that? So the reason for that is that you can quickly check again within, like ideally you have a, enough traffic to evaluate these 10%, but you quickly see, hey, okay, my new model is behaving as expected. It can handle the traffic. Um, we can slowly go from a 90-10 split to a 70-30, to a 50-50, to a full rollout. And with that, you just avoid major trouble and can quickly iterate if there's something going wrong, you know, okay, only 10% of the users were affected. We quickly iterate, test again at 10%. Great. Blue-green rollout is basically also called shadow mode where you let your current model run and it still makes the decisions, but your new model basically mimics the decision in the background. So you can, on 100% of the customer base, you can um, test it and see, hey, how would have my new models performed? So pretty straightforward. Usually also the easiest to implement from a technical perspective. And then last but not least is an AB rollout, where, which is quite similar to the Canary rollout, but you just split your user base 50-50 and both models actually make decisions. And then in the end, you compare it um, and see, okay, my new model performed like this. My old model, my current model performed like this. I see an increase in adoption. Um, so you can basically perform this A-B test on your models, which is from my experience, really common with recommender systems, for example. And here again, um, you should know what your department usually does. So for us, for a really long time, it has been the blue-green rollout. So we always knew upfront, we had the infrastructure in place, we had a general infrastructure in place that we were able to use. So our rollout was always super fast. We were never blocked by any technical issues and we're able, once we got our model, to ship it. And you should just be aware what you wanna have because the some of the models you build probably need some feedback from the user. So maybe a click or not. So blue green might not always be the right choice sometimes you need a canary rollout or an ab and you should just note before and with that we basically reach the end i hope um, you got a good understanding of why standardizing certain processes is so important i think i tried to stress it um in, in the on individual slides that if you in your team, in your organization, in your company, whatever, if you standardize a few processes, maybe someone writes some code that it's reusable, maybe someone builds infrastructure that it's reusable. If you have a project proposal that is reusable, other people can just jump on your projects faster, you can ship faster, you have a good foundation from which you can build. And I personally think that the faster you build and ship and learn, the better you will perform. And that's it from my side. Uh, so if there are any questions, happy to answer them. So a few people already say thanks for the for the great content. Um, I want to start with a question I have. So you finished your talk by saying that uh, by highlighting all the benefits of having the standard process. 
I'm wondering who should drive the standardization process. The st process, like standardization of the processes. Should it be a senior data scientist? Should it be a, like a data science manager? Should be, should it be like a product manager or, or all of the above? Like how, how does it usually happen? Yeah, I think I think it should lay within the team that is using it. So I've I've seen multiple forms of it. I think data science managers definitely have to be involved because they have to give their um, seniors the time to build this. Because if the data science manager doesn't give you the time to build something like that, then this is a problem. Though I also um, saw and experienced that there are dedicated teams to this. So um, at Shopify, we have a dedicated team that builds us. I don't know, infrastructure, for example, or it, we have um, an analytics team that builds these foundational um, data tables. So it's not sitting with us data scientists all the time because we have different focuses. But I think the data science manager should advocate for it. And then depending on the company size, to be really fair, um, and the maturity, there should be a dedicated team to lay the foundation. And if you're in a small startup, you have to do it yourself. Obviously, I get it. But if you have a dedicated team to lay this foundation, I think that's the best way to do it. Thank you. So I just want to remind that uh, we have this uh, link to Slido. Ask questions there. And yeah. I'll start with a question from Abhishek. Abhishek is asking about, like, there are a few ways of deploying a model. One is uh, fully automated and another one is more like manual. So in wild case, it's just, you know, something happens, like we see that um, our model our monitoring detects the drift, or maybe we just run it like, uh, I don't know, weekly and retain the model. And in another way, in a different way, there is a person who first looks at the results, maybe sees the, looks at the evaluation results in our evaluation store, or I don't remember how you called it. Mm, then you look at this performance and then you push a model, like you promote your model to production, right? Like you yeah. update something your model store. So which of these ways uh, should use and when? Um, I think it depends heavily on the industry. So before working in e-commerce, uh, Shopify, I work for a FinTech that is heavily regulated. So by nature, some human had to look at what we did and had to manually evaluate it. I am usually a fan, like if it's not mandatory, I think we have the technical abilities to implement enough tests, alerting, monitoring, to ensure an output that can be pushed automatically. So if it's not mandatory by law or the regulator, I would try to, in 95% of the cases, to go with the um, automated pushing. Because what you can do is, I mean, in the end, as I said, you want a statistical evaluation, you want a business evaluation, maybe you want to stress test your model. And that can all be automated. And if you set the right thresholds that the model needs to pass, then why should a human look at it? That's my take on it. Maybe I'm missing mm -hmm. something, but if so it's the already idea is that there is some sort of sort of gold standard, right? I mean, let's say we the old model, we evaluate the new model, and the condition for automatically deploying the model could be it's like at least two percent better, right? If it doesn't exactly. happen, then or at, it's at least like ninety percent, whatever metric. Right? Exactly. And then you just uh, maybe send an email, the model was deployed, blah, blah, blah. You inform, you don't ask for yeah. an approval. Yeah. Okay. Um, now I will share my screen because there, okay. there are a few questions. And I will need your help, Tina, to um, parse this question. I asked for clarification in live chat, but mm -hmm. like, um, yeah, I'll try to read it out loud. I don't know how much. Uh, it's a bit overloaded, I think it's. Yeah. So does that kind of realization where the model metrics are not good, but impact business-wise is good, make you re-engineer the predictor variables in some way? Yeah, so I think what this person means is basically if we see this conflicting information of um, worse statistical performance, but better business impact, like is that a reason for me to go back to the predictor variables and re-engineer them so that both metrics speak the same language that, that's how i understood it um mm -hmm. and sense. if if that's the case i assume that's uh that's the intention then i would say no um it's definitely possible but i think it would be a really narrow thinking to just improve my statistical metric to have a better metric 
in the end, I always care about the positive business impact. And if I achieve it with less accuracy, I think that um, that's more important than that both metrics are very performant. To be really fair, this, what I said was obviously also, it's not a regular case. I just wanted to highlight why business metrics are also important. Usually they speak the same language, but I would not go back and um, re-engineer my predictor variables. Yeah. Um, what kind of infrastructure I, you need? I'm yeah, muted. Sorry. I just wanted to say thank you for the question and thank you for the answer. Do you yeah. want to read this out loud yourself? Yeah, I can read it out loud. Perfect. Uh, what kind of infrastructure you need for canary, uh, blue, green, AB rollout and already existing products? What kind of challenges there could be? Um, so I personally, the canary and AB rollout, I did. I did them with the Google Cloud Platform. Um, I think many of those platforms, they provide some functionality like that. So they let you, without big technical knowledge, you have a really good UI and you can... Um, Perform with a few clicks, uh, you can already do a canary rollout, for example. And if Google does it, I haven't looked at AWS or other providers, but I'm pretty sure they have the same functionality, which is why, depending on what infrastructure you run, if you are already on a Google Cloud platform, it might be easy. If you're on another platform, it might be easy as well. If you have something on premise, it might be a bit more difficult, and depending on your company. But I think it's a big trend to move to the big platforms because. It's one of their main businesses and they are doing a great job there. I, I think Kubeflow supports that. I don't know if many people yeah. support Kubeflow, I mean, uh, or for, like all these open source platforms and then also closed source platforms. But uh, I think what you mentioned is you have a totally in-house built platform, then you might be in trouble, right? Because you'll need to implement this kind of functionality. Yeah, exactly. Um, and. I cannot speak for all companies, but the companies I talk to are moving away from in-house platforms because it's too much maintenance, it's too much work, and they are moving to um, one of the big providers, open source or not, um, and uh, that's what they are doing. And that also solves many challenges to come to the challenging part because Canary and AB rollout are often really, uh, really tough to deploy. It takes work. It, you are dependent on other teams, on their capacities, so it slows you down. Uh, and is prone to technical errors. Blue green, and I think that's why, or okay, shadow is um, the most common one. And I think it is because you, if you just deploy a shadow model, you can use exactly the same infrastructure that's already in place. You just don't connect any API to it or don't like, you just send the data to a dev table or whatever. You just don't act on it, but you can use exactly the same infrastructure. And I think that's why it is so popular. But at the same time, it obviously has the downside that you do not get direct feedback by users because no one is really shown the results of the challenger model. It's only working in shadow mode. And that, this is obviously the big advantage of Canary and AB, whereas Canary in my view is preferable because you can test it on a, small, um, on a smaller group. And if you have a lot of traffic, this smaller group can already be um, significant in terms of results. Um, I hope that answered it. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I, I hoped to have it ready um, by today. Unfortunately, the proofreading uh, took a bit longer. So if everything goes right, I'll publish it tomorrow or the day after. I also talked to um, Alexei that there will be a free, um, there will be a few free copies um, for this round. Um, I don't know how many participants we have, but- um, Can you will, tell yeah. us what it actually is for those yeah. who have no idea? Definitely. Um, so. The playbook I, I'm about to publish is basically what I tried to explain to you. So the, the main deliverable is a checklist for teams that can use this checklist to go through the entire process. So from the very beginning, from the design phase, from the very first step until the very last monitoring deployment governments and documentation step, you will have a checklist so you can go through it. Whenever you want to start a project, I noticed it's hard to consider all the aspects of it and I try to narrow it down so you can tick them off. You don't need all of them. You can scratch probably 20, 25% in your case. Others will scratch another 20%. But in the end, what it is, is it's one checklist that you can use to run through your um, ML projects in a standardized way. So you can share it with the team. Everyone does the same steps. Everyone meets the same requirements. And for each 
tick box, I basically also have an explaining chapter, which tells you what I mean, why I mean it, and why it's important. And with that, I want to achieve that teams use this checklist in all of their projects. So they always have the same deliverable and the same output quality. And if they switch teams within the organization, they know, okay, it's always the same pattern. Um, yeah. So this is um, what the what the playbook is about, and I hope it will help many people to to ship faster. That's the main the main mm -hmm. idea of it. So once you have the playbook, we will include the link in the description. Yeah. And as Perfect. you mentioned, you are going to give us a few copies that we will Correct. give away to the community. Exactly. So keep an eye on. I think we will do this in uh, um, social media. We will see. Perfect. Yeah, that's great. Sorry for the delay. Um, I decided to take one or two weeks longer to just deliver the best output I can deliver. Um, that's why it takes a bit longer. Okay. Well, the last question. How are the data chosen, for example, split it for an A-B testing? Is it randomly? Um, yeah. So I would always do random splits. Um, that's how I did my A-B test that worked the best. Um, Obviously, you need the traffic for um, for a significant A/B test, right? So if if you have don't have that much traffic and then um, not that many interactions, um, that might be a little hard. And you, ha I would then just recommend to let your A/B test run for a longer period until you have the data. But generally, I try to um, test uh, A/B always randomly. But I would still check that the populations and their predictor variables or whatever are kind of similar because randomly like it should be given that they are similar but better be sure than sorry or safe than sorry so i always do a few monitoring checks that my populations are actually similar but i do do the splits randomly yeah yeah and before we finish so many people ask for the slides so maybe you can just share the link while we're still here so yeah 100 percent. let me share right away because we did this a few times, and then uh, what always happens is then we share it like the next day, and by the time all people are gone and they don't come back. Nah, we don't want that. So I no. shared it in the chat here. Um, you should have access to it. Um, exactly. And if you have any questions, feel free to ping me on LinkedIn. I'm happy to chat with everyone about any topic. Um, if you want to know more, uh, feel free to let me know. So what I'm doing right now is I am adding the link to the slides to the description. So YouTube Perfect. usually automatically updates the description, but just in case, I will also put it to all the live chat. Amazing. So, um, yeah, you have it. Okay, and with that, I think that's all we have for today, right? So that's that was a lot of useful content. Thanks a lot for joining us today. Thanks everyone for joining us today too. Uh, and uh, I'm personally looking forward to your playbook. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks for everyone who joined. I really enjoyed it. And I'll definitely let you know uh, when I publish it. Okay, well, Perfect. enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. Goodbye. Thanks.